Uh, we're talking about money. We've been talking about money. Um, today we'll talk about the apostles and money. Uh, but this is the fourth and final Sunday of our survey of the Bible. And it's only a survey of what the Bible has to say about money because there are, in fact, over 2,000 verses in the Bible on money. It's the most common subject other than God himself. And so we've seen that Moses says that if Israel is truly going to be the people of God, they have to have a different economy. That when they come out of Egypt, they can't take Pharaoh's economy into the promised land because it will ruin the promised land. And so that's what we get from Moses, a lot of what we get from Moses. The prophets, they said that worship is meaningless if it doesn't affect how we make and spend our money. And so we would say it this way, uh, what we do on Sunday is of no more value than how much of it flows into Monday. You can't just keep it here. It has to flow into all the rest of our life. Jesus uh, teaches us that the love of money is the single biggest challenge to full participation in the kingdom of God. Jesus is inviting us into an abundant life. Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. But that means a reordering of our life. And initially, one of the biggest hindrances to really stepping into that is uh, keeping financial self-interest as a kind of God and idol. And we're going to see today that the apostles teach us that the newness of Christ touches all areas of our life, including our money. So let's get started. Let's look in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed which is idolatry. All right, the Apostle Paul tells us that through faith and baptism, we are united with the resurrection life of Christ. That there is a profound newness. That once our life is united with Christ and Christ becomes our life, then everything from top to bottom has to be reevaluated. We have to rethink everything in the light of Christ because we're called into this profound newness. Paul says if any person is in Christ through faith and baptism, anybody is in Christ, well, behold, it's a new creation. Everything is made new. So therefore, we should bury everything that belongs to the old ways of death, including greed, which the apostle Paul calls idolatry. And I think for most of us, at least, I would, say that, I would say that consumerism is the dominant idol in contemporary Western culture, that we see it everywhere. There are temples to consumerism everywhere we go. We may not recognize them as such, and that's a problem. We need to recognize that we are surrounded by the pagan worship of mammon in the form of consumerism, and we must continually challenge to put that to death and bury that in our own lives. And idolatry is the issue. There are really only two sins. It's idolatry and injustice, because there's really only two commands. There's two great commands. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. If we don't love God with all of our heart, we're seduced into idolatry. If we don't love our neighbor as ourselves, we will treat those around us with injustice. So if we love God with all of our heart, love our neighbor as ourselves, then we're on the right track. When we veer from that, we fall into the only two sins ultimately there are, which are idolatry and injustice. So uh, Moses, Jesus, the apostles and prophets all agree, now this is important, all agree that abundance is a blessing. Moses, Jesus, the apostles and prophets are not opposed to wealth per se. 
they all speak of it in various ways as a blessing, as, a, as part of goodness, as in part of the inherent goodness that God intends for human beings to have. But money must be kept in its proper place. Ultimately, what money is, is it's a tool for doing good. It's a tool for entering into the goodness of life. It's a tool for loving God and loving your neighbor. But if money becomes an object of trust, not a tool, but an object of trust, as you're placing your trust, okay, I'll, I'll, be at, I'll be at peace because I have enough money. I'll be at peace when I get. I'll be happy. If I ever get to this level, I'll be happy. That's, what, that's where money is now becoming an object of trust, and that's when it becomes an idol. And when money is an idol in our life, our financial life is characterized mostly by fear and greed, and it has nothing to do with how much money we do or do not have. We're just driven by fear, fear of lack, that there won't be enough, and, and greed, there's always has, we always have to have more and more. There's never an arrival at a place of trust and satisfaction and peace. So money is to be a tool, not a God. And our financial life, as those have, have entered into the newness of Christ, is to be characterized not by fear and greed, but by trust and generosity. Those are the two key words. First of all, we're not trusting money, we're trusting God. And we are... Um, generous. We, we like to give. We're, we're prone towards generosity. Okay. So like Moses and the prophets and Jesus who preceded them, the apostles, of course, have a lot to say about money. James, this is the brother of Jesus who became the first pastor of the first church. James, the pastor of of the church in Jerusalem is, you know, he's got a letter that bears his name, the epistle of James, and in that he is fierce in his insistence that there be no favoritism in the church based upon financial status. If he, if he sees any of that, he just goes off. He says, no, not, not in the church. Financial status does not reflect in favoritism for for the rich in the church. He's, he's very against that. And he also stresses that the rich must engage in fair wage practices or face the judgment of God. It's a very fiery epistle, and he's pretty strong about that. The apostle Peter tells pastors to do their work not for financial gain, but from a shepherd's heart. John the Elder, in his three epistles, stresses that if we say we love God, but are not generous in helping our needy brothers and sisters that we are in fact practicing a deep self-deception. That if we say, oh yes, I love God, I love God, I love God, but we ignore the needs of our brothers and sisters around us that in fact we don't love God, we're practicing a deep deception. The unknown writer of Hebrews tells the early Christians to keep their lives free from the love of money by having a complete confidence that God will take care of them. All right, that's just a, a touched on a, a few of what the apostles say about money, but since 13 of the epistles in the New Testament are attributed to the apostle Paul, I want to focus on some of what he said about money, and of course, Paul said a lot about money. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Now concerning the collection for the saints, you should follow the directions I gave to the churches of Galatia. All right, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the conclusion of Paul's grand treatise on resurrection. For the whole chapter, chapter 15, he has been talking about resurrection, and his culminating statement is, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the victory is victory over death. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory, and the victory is victory over death. Because the great problem facing humanity that the gospel solves is the problem of death which threatens to rob life of its meaning and so the great joyful christian announcement proclaimed every sunday in churches around the world is that christ through death entered into death that he might defeat death 
that death might no longer have dominion over us. So that when we die, as it were, we encounter the one who has conquered death and who is our Lord. And the ultimate hope, the ultimate hope for the Christian is not to go to heaven when we die, but resurrection and the restoration of all things. That there is somehow a continuation that we, we don't just go off to a non-spatial, non-corporal, uh, uh, disembodied heaven. We, we rest in the Lord, we wait, but that the grand vision set forth in Scripture is that there comes a time when there is the renewal of this earth and a new creation, but it's material, it's physical, because it's good, and God's going to restore it and heal it, and this, this is the blessed hope of Christian faith. And because of that, that's why Paul says, therefore... Okay, thanks be to God who gives us the victory over death through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, therefore, be steadfast, immovable. Keep doing what you're doing because your labor is not in vain. In other words, there is some kind of carryover and continuation from this life into the age to come because they are connected because death has been defeated. Death is the thing that just severs, but death has been defeated in Christ. And there is to be a continuation. So we, we've been given the victory, therefore... What we do here counts. And then chapter 16, it's, a, it's an awkward place to put the chapter division. Paul didn't do that, you know. That was an arbitrary thing that was done. Now, now, let's take an offering. That's how it works. I mean, Paul goes from, you know, he, he has a grand theological treatise on resurrection. Thanks be to God who gives us a victory over death. And therefore, let's keep doing what we're doing because it matters. Now, let's take up an offering. That's the flow. And that's exactly what he's talking about. Um, what Paul is doing here, and this is a, I think this is good that you get this. Paul is taking up an, a special offering for the poor saints, he calls them, believers, in Jerusalem. These are Jewish believers. These are Jewish people who have come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. And... Um, they're impoverished because of a number of circumstances that have occurred there. You understand wealth is not generally distributed equally throughout the world. Pockets of prosperity, pockets of poverty. And Jerusalem was impoverished especially, as Paul calls them, the saints, the Jewish believers. And Paul is now going around all of the Gentile churches in Macedonia, Galatia, Achaia, and he is taking up an offering. He says, I want to take this. I want you Gentiles to give generously in an offering. And I'm going to take it to the poor saints in Jerusalem. Now, this is, this is a practical outworking of love. But it's more than that. It's also a profound gesture of what is Paul's greatest theological project. And that is to show how Jews and Gentiles belong to one family in Christ. And he said, this is going to be such a powerful symbol of kingdom come is when you Gentiles give generously to your Jewish brothers and sisters, thus acknowledging that in Christ we're all one family. So that's what's going on. Now we go to the second letter that Paul writes uh, to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Um, he, he, this is written, we don't know, a few months later. He writes like this. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. Okay. Corinth is south, the southern part of Greece, and Achaia, and then up in the north part is Macedonia. It's another part of Greece. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity. Notice how many times this word generosity or generous comes up in this passage. I think it's seven times in this passage. Six or seven. On their part, uh, wealth of generosity on their part, for as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means and even beyond their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints, that is the, the poor saints in Jerusalem. And this, not merely as we expected, they gave themselves first to the Lord and by the will of God to us so that we might urge Titus. Titus is, 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 is the worker that Paul has left in Corinth to kind of be in charge of this generally troubled church. They have some problems there and Titus is, is there trying to restore order. 
so that we might urge Titus that as he had already made a beginning in raising this offering, so he should also complete this generous undertaking among you. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in your love, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. All right, so this is Paul's second letter. Titus is not from Corinth. He's one of Paul's traveling companions. He's one of Paul's assistants. And Paul had been in Corinth, and he had to leave. And he said, Titus, you stay. And Titus apparently has written some letters to Paul and say, I'm having trouble getting this offering raised. They don't seem to quite be as excited about it as when we first introduced the idea. When it was a concept, they were on board. But when we actually started you know, asking them to actually give, they're not doing so much. And so Paul is responding to that. And he's urging them to become generous by pointing to another group of churches up in Macedonia. He said, now these people. Corinth was a wealthy city. Macedonia was not a wealthy place. Corinthians had more access to economic success than what was in Macedonia. And, but Paul says, now these Macedonians, you know, they, they don't have much. Uh, in fact, there, a lot of them are in poverty. But they gave super generously. They gave all they could. They even gave beyond their means. And so Paul is saying, you know, you might want to, you know, pay attention to what the Macedonians are doing. Can you do something like that? They gave voluntarily. They gave generously. And uh, he says that generosity is a spiritual practice to excel at. Now, how do, how do you learn to excel in generosity? Well, Paul says the first thing you do is you give yourself to the Lord. You give your whole life to the Lord. When you have really done that, when, you, when you've given your life to Jesus, then everything is his. And if Jesus says, I want you to give so much, you just say, it's, it's all yours anyway, Jesus. I'll give you whatever you think. I used to struggle with this early on, early on. And I'd be in some meeting and somebody would be taking up an offering. And I would think, I don't and, and I would feel that I'd, I'd start to hesitate. And you know what I would do? I, you know, it's long enough, I'll tell this story now. I, when I caught myself doing that, I would get mad at myself. And I'd say, just for that, I'm going to give twice as much as I'd planned on. Just because just, I didn't want that economic self-interest to dominate my generosity. And so I would just beat it down. Yeah, bring it up again and I'll give four times as much. Just stop it, buddy. That was the argument going on in my own head with myself. But it, it, it broke that. And so Paul is encouraging generosity, and the key to generosity is to first give yourself to the Lord. Let's continue. Verse 8, I do not say this as a command. It's not a law. I'm not commanding you. I can't tell you what to do. But I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty, you might become rich. So it's not a command, but let's be honest about it. Paul is putting pressure on the Corinthians. He's saying, I, I'm not, I can't make you do this. This is not a law. You don't have to do it. It's just a test to see how genuine your love is. And I'm testing the genuineness of your love by comparing it to the earnestness of the poor believers in Macedonia who have given a whole lot. You can see that there's pressure being put upon the Corinthian church to, to get with the project. Um, the theological foundation for Christian generosity is Jesus himself. That's why Paul says, well, you know, think about it like this. Jesus was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. So we, we see Jesus as living a life of self-giving love. Self-giving love. And the Christian theological foundation for generosity is that we are imitating the self-giving love of Jesus Christ because we are, by self-designation, we are Christians, Christians. We are, we are Jesusites. We are little Christ. We are those that are trying to imitate our Lord by our own life. And so Paul is urging them toward generosity. Let's go to chapter 9. Uh, by the way, two entire chapters in the New Testament are a fundraising appeal letter. Now that may, you know, you, you may not like that, but Paul doesn't care. 
And here's the thing. Here's the thing. We can't be more spiritual than the New Testament. So I don't, I, don't like, I don't like these people raising money in church. Well, you know, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Don't, don't try to be more spiritual than the New Testament. Amen. Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 9, 6. The point is this. The one who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work, as it is written. He scatters abroad, gives to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity. There's that word over and over. Which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. So Paul in talking to the Corinthians about giving in this offering introduces the idea that he's actually borrowing from Jesus to think of it in terms of sowing and reaping. Now, this is a, this is a, this is a theme that can be and has been abused. You see the televangelists do that all the time. Uh, but in its pure form, it comes from Paul and it comes from Jesus. That we can think of giving as sowing. Give and it shall be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken, gather, running over. She'll be given back to you. That's, that's Jesus. Paul says very much the same thing here. That as we are giving, we are sowing, and God is able to make all grace abound to you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. And then he says, now God supplies seed and bread. God saw bread is what meets your need, but seed, and that's what he mentions first, is for sowing. So in other words, we don't consume all that we get. We have income, it becomes our bread, it sustains us, we do all the stuff we do with it, but there's a part of it that's not to be consumed as bread, there's part of it that's seed that's to be sown, that is, in Paul's language, that's a metaphor for giving, that we don't keep, we don't consume everything that comes to us, but the first part, we learn to give back, Paul uses the metaphor, that's like Sowing, that's like sowing, because then you're participating in the grace of God, and God is able to make all grace abound to you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance, because that's a good thing, not a bad thing, for every good work. And then he says that, uh, he says that, uh, he says that Christian generosity produces thanksgiving to God. So we have this Project 58, you know, drawn from Isaiah 58, the fast that God chooses to share with the poor. We have those boxes back there. So I just looked in the bulletin today. Your Project 58 donations helped a couple in our church who are both struggling with numerous and serious health issues. We paid an overdue utility bill for them. Isn't that a beautiful thing? A couple in this church, both, struggling with serious health issues and because of that they're you know behind on a utility bill and we paid that now what do they do what do they do I mean I haven't talked to Megan about it she oversees that project but I, I know that when we tell them okay we're going to take care of that utility bill that's overdue what do they do they're grateful they're thankful yes they're thankful to word of life I'm sure no doubt but but what do they say they're saying thank God Thank God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. You came through for us. Thank you, Jesus. So I want to be a part of helping produce that overflow of thanksgiving. That's what Paul is saying. He says, come on, let's, let's be a miracle for someone else. Because you know, when we finally get this offering, we take it to Jerusalem and give it to the poor saints in Jerusalem, they're going to overflow with thanksgiving to God. Amen. Right, let's look at one more, one more passage. One more passage. This is from Philippians Philippians 4.19, a very famous passion, passage. Philippians 4.19, And my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. This is a, this is a wonderful promise, wonderful passage to hold on to. I have. 
I, I memorized it a long time ago. Was, my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know, when you're feeling financial pressure and, you, and you're feeling the, the sense of lack, you know, you hold on to this promise. My God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. But Philippians 4.19 doesn't just float out there on nothing. There's actually a context. So let me back up a few verses to verse 15 and see what Paul is actually saying here. You Philippians, indeed know that in the early days of the gospel... When I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. I have been paid in full and have more than enough. I am fully satisfied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And now, my God, shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So, so Paul is this itinerant preacher. And when he has to, he sustains himself with his uh, tent-making trade. But he really needs to give himself full time to his apostolic work. And so there was one group of churches, and they were the churches in Macedonia, that said, Paul, you just go do what you're supposed to do, and we'll take care of you. But there are times when he was impoverished, and he didn't have any money, and it's rough, and it's tough, and it's hard. But Epaphroditus, a member of the ch- one of the churches in Macedonia, has come and brought this offering to Paul. And Paul says, well, that's a... That's like a, that's a, that's a sacrifice to God. That's a sweet-smelling sacrifice. And I've received it, and it's met my needs. I'm, 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 I'm okay now. I'm taken care of. I'm fully provided for. And my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Because they had been acting in generosity, Paul is confident to say that kind of generosity will come back to you when you need it. Amen. Amen. Now, if we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit... Um, we will be given divine opportunities to practice Christ-like generosity. I want to tell you a story, end with this story. It was 14 years ago. It was October 12th, 2006. It was a Monday. I was flying back from Michigan, and I had a connecting flight through Chicago. There was an early winter snowstorm in the upper Midwest wreaking havoc with the flights. Got out of Detroit late, finally got to Chicago. You're looking at the boards, cancel, 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 delay, 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 cancel, delay. All the flights are canceled or delayed. I'd already missed my flight to Kansas City. And so I thought, well, first thing I want to be, because I might end up having to stay here. I don't want to stay in the airport. So I booked a hotel. And I almost just went to the hotel. But, but then I saw there was a flight that was going to go from Chicago O'Hare to Kansas City. I thought, well, maybe I can get on that one. So I went down to gate K-9. I remember, because you remember that, K-9. I went down to gate K-9, and I, and I got on the standby. I was number 18 on the standby list. You don't ever get on when you're number 18 on standby. And I almost left. I almost left. But I thought, well, what am I going to do? I'm just going to go to a hotel and sit around. I might as well just sit here and just see. You never know. And so I thought, well, I'll just sit here and see because you never know. And I was just reading a book anyway. So I can read a book here at the gate as well as I can read it at the hotel. I was reading. It was my first N.T. Wright book, Derek. I was reading The Challenge of Jesus by N.T. Wright. It was 14 years ago. I've read like all of them since then. But that was my first one. And I was in, actually I was enthralled by it. And so I didn't really care where I was. On a plane, in the airport, in a hotel. All I wanted to do was read this book. So I thought, well, I'll just sit here and see what happens. So I sat down and I'm just enthralled in The Challenge of Jesus by N.T. Wright. And while I'm reading... I smelled India. I smelled India. I've been to India a lot. It has a certain fragrance. It's exotic. I like it. 
It's curry spices and all that sort of thing. Think sandalwood and spices, and it's just, to me, it's the smell of India. And I sat there and I just, I smelled India. And for the first time, I noticed the man sitting next to me. I looked at him and he, he appeared to be Indian. And the moment I looked at him, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, This man is from India, he's a pastor. This is his first time in America, and he needs your help. It was just like, I, I, just, I smell India, I look, and just flies through my mind. This man is from India, he's a pastor, it's the first time in America, and he needs my help. But you know, you're thinking, did, I, did the Holy Spirit really say that? Or was that just me? But then I'm thinking, well, why would I think that? I mean, why would that just come to me? So I, I broached the subject. Pardon me. You're on your way to Kansas City, yeah? If you don't mind me asking, where are you from? I'm from India. I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> but you could maybe get that by just looking. He was from Bhopal. I've been in Bhopal several times. He was born in Orissa, but was ministering in Bhopal. I said, well, okay, how about that? Um, if you don't mind me asking, what do you do? I'm a pastor. Yes, two for two. <laughs> Yeah, really, so am I. How about that? Uh, so, uh, you've been to America before? Nope, this is my first time. Dang, three for three. So I said, well, okay, now, so why are you coming to America? Well, I'm going to a, a conference, a minister's conference in Kansas City. I said, okay, that's great. Um, but remember, that voice had said, he's, he's from India, he's a pastor, first time in America, and he needs your help. So I pressed a little bit. I said, so you're going to this conference. Yeah, do you have a place to stay? No. Nope. Anybody arranged to pick you up at the airport? No. And then I just got bold. I said, well, how much money do you have? $40. Yikes. I mean, that's, a, that's not even going to get you out of the airport, hardly. I mean, you know, you're going to get a taxi from the air, and you know. So I knew that I had to find a way to take care of him. Oh, I got on the plane. I was the last one. There were, I, I was 18, and 18 got on. I was the last one. We ended up, brought him up here to St. Joe before the conference and, and found him housing, took care of him. And then, it, you know, after a week or so, I don't remember, it was time for him to go home. So I was going to take him to the airport. But I said, I'm going to pick you up really early before we go to the airport. He said, okay. So I, so I got him, and instead of going to KCI... I went to Walmart. I said, we got to go to Walmart first. He said, why? I said, have you ever been to a Walmart? Nope. He said, well, I said, there's nothing more American than going to a Walmart. So if you're going to have the American experience, that's it. Eat a hamburger and go to Walmart. So we got to go to Walmart. All right. So, you know, he'd never seen a Walmart. So we go into Walmart. And I said, um, I took him over to where they had the luggage. I said, uh, I'm going to buy you this suitcase. He said, oh, I don't need a suitcase. I said, that's what you think. You're going to need a suitcase. I already got a suitcase. You're going to need another one. I see, he said, what? I said, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to fill this up. The suitcase. We're gonna, we buy the suitcase first, and then we go around and we fill it up. I said, you know, I know you got a wife. you got some daughters. Yeah, uh, buy some things for them. Get some things for them. And we spent like an hour walking around that Walmart, filling up that suitcase. Whew. Gives tears to my eyes even thinking about it. On that day, I quite probably had more joy shopping in Walmart than anyone has ever had in history. I, I, do, I go to Walmart out of sheer necessity. I mean, it's where I go in, Lord Jesus, be with me. And, uh, but that day, it was joy unspeakable, full of glory. Filling up a suit, Primraj Nag, that's his name. I think Perry still has some contact with him now, and then he might hear this sermon. Hello, Primrose, I love you dearly. And so, um, we do that because the Apostle Paul said this. We must support those in need, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus. For he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. 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 Amen.